Welcome to the 2019 Hibernian Lecture. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings, and I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a professor of American Studies and History at Notre Dame. I'd like to welcome and acknowledge a few people joining us today. Um, first are the staff and fellows of the Keonocton Institute for Irish Studies which is co-sponsoring today's lecture. I especially want to thank Patrick Griffin, the director of Keonocton Institute and the Madden Henbury Family Professor of History at Notre Dame. Okay. Thank you. I also would like to thank um, the, we routinely co-sponsor the Hibernian Lecture with the Keonocton Institute. So while it's wonderful, it's kind of old news. Big news is that this year's lecture is co-sponsored with the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. And its director, Professor Christina Walbrecht of the Department of Political Science, um, is also here today. And we are absolutely delighted to have this event as part of the programming marking the centennial of women's suffrage. 100 years since, as the late Cokie Roberts pointed out shortly before her death, not of women being granted the vote, but of the right of women as citizens um, uh, being recognized by Congress. So it's great that this event is part of a series of events that will be held throughout this year. And of course, we extend a very special welcome to members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians who are with us today. Thank you all so much for joining us again this year. For more than 40 years, the Hibernian support has enabled the Kushwa Center to promote the study of Irish and Irish American history and culture in a variety of ways. We offer research awards each year to support publication projects in the field, and our conferences regularly feature topics in Irish American history and more recently on the global history of Irish Catholicism. We're especially excited that this year the Kushwa Center has partnered with Notre Dame Center for Italian Studies and the Keonocton Institute for Irish Studies to co-sponsor a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Aberdeen's Research Institute for Irish and Scottish Studies. Rose Luminello is a recipient of a fellowship and she is uh, uh, working on launching a project that would examine Irish Catholic sisters as missionaries throughout the English-speaking world between 1840 and 1950. Of course, the centerpiece of the Kushwa Center's commitment to Irish studies has, been, has long been this annual Hibernian Lecture, and I'm so very pleased to welcome Professor Tara McCarthy as our lecturer this afternoon. Professor McCarthy is Associate Professor of History at Central Michigan University. She received her PhD in History at the University of Rochester, where she spent a year as a postdoctoral teaching fellow in the writing program. Before joining Central Michigan University, she spent a year as a visiting assistant professor of history at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. Her research and teaching focus on American women, social reform movements, and immigration. At CMU, Professor McCarthy serves as the Director of Undergraduate Studies and a member of the College Curriculum Committee and the Women's Studies Governance Council. She has received grants from the Irish American Cultural Institute, Irish Research Fund, and the Susan B. Anthony Institute for Gender and Women's Studies. She has published numerous scholarly articles on women's influence in labor, rights, social reform, and Irish American culture, as well as the book, Respectability and Reform, Irish American Women's Activism, 1880 to 1920, released by Syracuse University Press in 2018. And I was supposed to bring it up with me and hold it up, but I'll hold it up when I get back to my seat as she's making her way up here. Um, the title of today's lecture is A Century of Suffrage, Catholic Activism, Class Consciousness, and the Contributions of Irish American Women. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tara McCarthy. Thank you. Is that high enough? I want to thank you all for coming and thank the University of Notre Dame and especially the Kushwa Center and all of the co-sponsors for having me here. It's always a good hour when you get to talk about women and it's a good year to talk about women. The 100th anniversary of suffrage or the ratification, the 100th anniversary of the ratification will be 2020. And of course, the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians is celebrating its 125th anniversary as well. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here. So let me start by explaining why I'd wanted to talk about suffrage. My own research is on Irish women. Most of them are also Catholic. And so it was an opportunity for me to combine those two with the anniversary of the amendment and talk specifically about the contributions that Irish women made to the movement 
Um, we don't hear as much about Irish women or Catholic women in the suffrage movement, and so I've been trying to find some of them, and I found quite a few. And I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to introduce you to some of them. In 1915, suffragists staged a dramatic pilgrimage to the home of Margaret Brent, a Catholic who had also, was also the first woman to petition for the vote in the American colonies. A group of women traveled by wagon, described in the press as the prairie schooner, and I do actually have a picture of this for you. There it is. It's hard, don't try to read it, but it's hard to see. Um, but that's um, the woman I'm going to talk about over there on the side, okay? Uh, Mary O'Toole was her name. Mary O'Toole was, an, was the Irish-born secretary of the College Equal Suffrage Association in Washington, D.C. And she, she joined the caravan for two weeks. It took, I think, about 14 days for them to go by this schooner uh, all the way to Maryland. Um, from DC, and so she basically spent two weeks on this in this caravan uh, giving suffrage talks um, while she was a suffragist. Um, O'Toole had moved to New York from Ireland at the age of 16. She described her father as being, quote, a farmer who was associated with Parnell in the Land League days. And she went on to law school, became a lawyer, and ultimately became a judge. President Harding appointed her as the first female mun municipal judge in Washington, DC. Now, Mary O'Toole is just an example. She's just one of a wave of activism by Catholic women in support of equal suffrage in the early 20th century. And I decided to try and narrow this. It can be, it's, it's a big topic, but I, just, I chose two things. So I'm going to focus in particular on the state suffrage campaigns, which I'll explain in just a minute, and then the development of separate Catholic suffrage organizations. Okay? So I'm going to start with a map no history professor can resist, right? Whoops. There we go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about suffrage, just to kind of give a background, and we'll get to the women uh, in a minute. Um, but when we're talking about the 100th anniversary of suffrage, and we're talking about the 100th anniversary of women voting in presidential elections, it's really not all women. Some women already had the vote, or had the right to vote just in presidential elections. And so what this map does is give you a sense of who had the vote in 1915, and I'll get back to the map in just a minute. But let me back up my story a little bit. When women started asking for the vote in the 19th century, but particularly after the Civil War, once you, actu you had actual suffrage um, associations starting about 1869, 1870, there were really three ways for women to try and get the vote. And they tried all of them in the 19th century. Three ways. One is the Federal Amendment strategy. That's ultimately how women get the vote. But they did actually try that strategy in the 19th century. It just didn't go anywhere, and so they gave up on it. Another strategy that they tried in the 19th century was a Supreme Court strategy, where they started to argue that women actually already had the vote based on the wording of the 14th Amendment that said all women, all, all persons, all citizens, I'm sorry, all persons are citizens, right? I got that. Not all women are citizens. All persons are citizens, not just men, but also that states could not deprive any individual of the privileges and immunities of citizenship, right? And so what suffrage supporters said, well, women are people, and we can all agree on that. People are citizens born in the United States, and states can't take away your rights as citizens. So the question was, and this is in the 1870s, the question was, was voting a privilege of citizenship? Now, when I asked my college students this, they all, of course, say yes, but in the 1870s, women decided to test it by going to the polls. And so they started showing up to vote. And they were usually turned away, although you may have heard the famous story, Susan B. Anthony actually got in. She was able to convince the man working at the polls that day to let her in, and she voted. And then she was arrested for voting. And ultimately, it wasn't her case, but another woman's case goes all the way to the Supreme Court in the mid-1870s. And the Supreme Court has to decide whether or not voting is a privilege of citizenship. And I bet you can all guess that they decided no. Okay? So those two strategies, the Federal Amendment strategy and the Supreme Court strategy, were not successful. And that left one other strategy, which was the state-by-state -state strategy. And suffragists had been trying this since the 1870s. Between 1870 and 1890, which is the year the two suffrage organizations actually merged into one big suffrage organization. In the first essentially 20 years of the suffrage movement, only two states passed women's suffrage, okay? 
between 1890 and 1910, two more states. 40 years, four states, okay? So my point is the state-by-state -state strategy was slow, it was expensive, and it was off, often unsuccessful. However, and this is a big however, things started to gain some momentum in the early 20th century. You had California coming in in 1911, a whole bunch of states coming in in 1914. So by 1915, you can kind of get a sense of the map, and I know you can't probably read it, at least not from the back, but the green states are the states that granted full stuff. Granted, you said, no, I've said it, haven't I? <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, the, the green states are the states that passed full suffrage for women, okay? And you can tell just by the visual that they're all in the West, okay? Then there are some partial suffrage. And then the red ones are no suffrage at all, okay? Now the problem with the map, and I always use this map in my class too, but the problem with the map is that New York is green on this map, and that's actually wrong. New York shouldn't be green yet because New York didn't actually pass the suffrage referendum until 1917. It failed in 1915, as did the one in Massachusetts, but I'm gonna tell you all about them anyway. But it passed in 1917. So if we change the date to 1917, maybe the map would be right, I don't know, I'd have to check some other states. But ultimately, you get the idea. There are a lot of women who do have the vote. They're largely in the West, but no big Eastern states have passed suffrage Referenda, referenda, even though the several of them have attempted to, okay? So I have another map, this is 1919, same idea basically where things are at when the federal amendment passes and then is ratified of course in 1920. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is we'll hold off on people for a minute um, and I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Carrie Chapman Cat just for a second and then we'll get to some of the people and what I want to do is talk about some of the people before I start to tell you all the things that they did, give you just quick backgrounds and stuff like that. So in 1915, the date of the, the first map that I showed you, um, Carrie Chapman Catt assumes the presidency of NASA, that's the National American Women's Suffrage Association, so historians usually shorten that to NASA. NASA is actually a combination of the two suffrage associations that were founded after the Civil War. They didn't play nice for about 20 years, and then they eventually merged in 1890. So that's the main suffrage organization for the time period anyway, and we, we aren't really going to talk about Alice Paul and the NWP today because it just didn't make it into the talk. But, um, but so Carrie Chapman Catt, she takes over the presidency in 1915, and the next year she unveils her plan, which is essentially to use those, I should go back to my map, but to use the big uh, western states, the women in those states, to start to kind of put pressure on uh, the president, on Congress for a federal amendment. But what she really wants is some big eastern states to come in with all those women's votes too. So she really wants to work hard in eastern states, particularly New York, as we'll talk about in just a minute, okay? And so to win voters in large eastern states like New York and Massachusetts, not surprisingly, they need to be able to appeal to a large number of voters, to, uh, to, to ethnic voters, to Jewish voters, to Catholic voters, et cetera. And so suffragists know that they need to be better at reaching diverse audiences. Uh, and they also create a committee called the Committee on Church Work, uh, which was created earlier but hadn't really made Catholic women a priority quite yet. Uh, but in the 19-teens, a new chairperson takes over. Her name was Mary Craig. And she begins to focus the committee's attention on Catholics. And she says, quote, more and more, I am led to believe that the most important work before suffragists today is church work, especially the organizing of Catholic women, that they will make their demands so emphatic the church will see the wisdom of supporting the movement. And so she starts to focus, or NASA as a whole starts to focus more on work among Catholics, and in order to work among Catholics, they want to get uh, speakers who can appeal to those communities as well. And so, so what you see is really a demand for suffrage speakers in three areas, and I've divided them, I've organized them this way. So uh, labor speakers, ethnic, particularly Irish speakers and for our purposes today, uh, and then um, Catholic. So all the, obviously those three categories overlap quite a lot. And so what it does is it kind of brings to the fore certain speakers who I want to introduce you to. Uh, this woman didn't actually really make it into my talk, but I still love her, so if she ended up on there, and I'm going to mention her anyway. Uh, her name is Maud Malone. They called her Militant Maud Malone. Uh, she was from New York, 
Um, she was from an Irish family. Her father had come from Ireland as a teenager and returned to Ireland and then come back to go to medical school in the U.S. and stayed. And his brother was actually a priest in New York, one of the larger parishes in New York. He was an associate of McGlynn um, in New York. And so she was from a really kind of socially engaged family. Um, and she becomes a suffragist and she becomes a militant. And she essentially, she joins a group called the American Suffragists, which was a very small militant suffrage group in New York. But ultimately, she kind of breaks from them, and she's kind of on her own. And so she just starts interrupting um, lectures and things just on her own. And so they call her the lone militant or the lone suffragette because she's not a part of a group anymore. She just waltzes in to Teddy Roosevelt's you know, uh, speeches or Woodrow Wilson's speeches during the election in 1912, and she just starts yelling, heckling at them, why don't you support women's suffrage, or something like that, and they throw her out. And she actually ends up being, I think she's the first, technically speaking, the first suffragist who, who's arrested for her suffrage activities. And she will later also be arrested at the White House and goes to prison with Alice Paul and that sort of more famous group. Um, she's part of that as well. But she's arrested long before that uh, for interrupting Woodrow Wilson's speeches uh, and, and ultimately being thrown out. Uh, this, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus much more on Margaret Foley. This is the, the first PowerPoint that you saw. She's the tall one, uh, Margaret Foley. Margaret Foley was from Roxbury, Massachusetts. She was a working class woman who really sort of came up through the labor unions and became a labor organizer. But ultimately, she's known as a suffrage speaker. She's known as a suffrage speaker. And again, like Militant Maud Malone, who I gave you before, she had that reputation as being a militant. They actually sent her to train. So Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association actually sent her to train in Great Britain. They had two suffragists who they sent to Great Britain to kind of study militant techniques and to bring them back to Massachusetts. And this was around 1911, 1912, somewhere around there. And so anyway, she comes back to the Boston area, and they send her to these local, you know, uh, Irish Catholic, local Boston politicians' rallies and stuff. And again, her job is essentially to heckle them. So she'll go out there, she'll stand on something uh, to make herself tall. She was actually about my height. She was tall anyway. And she would be like, why don't you support women's suffrage? And she, they, one of the things they actually did was a group of suffragists, they followed the candidate for governor, who I think was a Republican, but they were nonpartisan about this. They didn't care what party you were. If you weren't a suffragist, they would essentially heckle you. So anyway, the, the candidate for governor at the time, they just followed him from stop to stop. So all day long, he would go out and give a speech, and there they would be. And then he'd go to the next town, and there they would be. So you kind of get the sense. Um, the idea was if, you're, if you don't support suffrage, we're going to try and defeat you, OK, no matter what party you are. So she had quite a reputation. And she will become really in demand, particularly in Irish groups, Catholic groups, and again, labor groups. So I'll talk about that again in just a minute as well. Um, one of my very favorites is Leonore O'Reilly. This is also my favorite picture of her. Leonore O'Reilly was from New York. This is her mother, Winifred O'Reilly. Um, Leonore O'Reilly was, um, essentially, they worked in the garment industry. Her mother had, and her mother and father had had a small grocery store. Her father died when she was very young. Her mother eventually loses the grocery store and ends up in the factories. And essentially, mother and daughter work in the factories together. Um, but she's very involved in the labor movement. She has a lot of mentors, I would say, among middle class women, and ultimately becomes a full time organizer with the Women's Trade Union League uh, and becomes a suffrage speaker as well. And so she enters into our story largely as an organizer and also as the mentor of this woman whose name is Margaret Hinchy. Margaret Hinchy's Irish-born. Most of the people I'm telling you about are American-born to Irish parents, but Margaret Hinchy is Irish-born. Uh, she worked in the laundry. She worked in the laundry until she was blacklisted for a strike that she helped to organize, and she couldn't get a job in the laundry anymore. And eventually, she ends up also working for the Women's Trade Union League and the suffrage movement. And again, they send her out to, to particularly to groups who are looking for a Catholic speaker or an Irish speaker. And again, a union speaker. She's got a pretty good reputation in labor circles as well. So all of these women essentially fit in all three of those categories. And I think that's the last one. So we'll hold off on the rest of that for just a minute. So let me give you some examples of the kind of things these women were doing and how they were being sent out. So keep in mind, in these cases, essentially, suffrage organizations are requesting these women for their state campaign. So if there's a campaign in Ohio or Montana or Nevada or anywhere where there's a state campaign going on, they're like, we need speakers. And they're asking for these speakers to come from out of state, to come and spend some weeks 
uh, in, uh, in Nevada or Montana or wherever giving speeches, and they particularly want those, those categories that I told you about. So here's my first example. This is a letter from Jeanette Rankin. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to Congress from Montana. Montana woman uh, got the vote earlier than a lot of the other states, as you saw on the map. And so she writes, quote, one of the women the antis were planning to bring to Montana is an old friend of yours, Minnie Bronson. And I have heard that you were the best antidote for Bronson. So if she does come, we believe that we will have to have you. She's writing to Margaret Foley. I believe we will have to have you, and I believe you could do a great amount of good in our labor towns. And then Rankin also says, oh, asks, I'm sorry, asks, do you belong to a union? Okay, so this is important. Uh, the Christian Science Monitor out, uh, from Boston reported that Foley was in demand in Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, and St. Louis, Missouri, and that she spent two months campaigning in Nevada in 1914 for a suffrage referendum that actually passed. So in this case, what we're really talking about here is that Margaret Foley is a paid speaker and organizer for the suffrage movement. Th these women all have backgrounds in mostly the factory, but they're able to leave the factory for various reasons, but in this case, because of the suffrage movement. They get jobs with the suffrage movement. They get paid for their speeches, okay? And that will become a factor uh, in a minute as well. So my next example is Margaret Hinchy. Same thing, in this case also Montana. They want Margaret Hinchy. Uh, and so a woman named Mary O'Neill writes to, uh, to uh, Leonora O'Reilly, and she says, quote, Miss Rankin appreciates the splendid character and the ability of Miss Hinchy. And as a speaker, in her direct appeal to the labor unions, and these we must largely depend here. And then she goes on to say, the union men here all seem to have heard of her work in New York. If the federated unions are appointed with the effort of the members, Ms. Hinchy, being a member of the executive board of the Women's Trade Union League, will be an open sesame to the unions in the city in this state. So again, you can see there that in both of those cases, they're specifically talking about how to win the labor vote and needing women who are really active in unions. And of course, they happen to be Irish, and they also happen to be Catholic, and that's not really a coincidence. The union, both in, in terms of men and women, you see disproportionate numbers of Irish uh, in leadership positions in unions. So even after the Irish are not a large percentage of the working class, they're still a pretty large percentage of leadership. The Irish are very active in unions, and that's true for Irish women as well. When I give my lectures in my women's history class, I'm like, and she was an Irish woman, and she was an Irish woman, and it, it is, there are a lot. Um, since there were a lot, they're also using those speakers to send them out for Irish Day celebrations and things like that and ways to, to appeal to people's ethnic identity. And so these same speakers are, are in uh, demand for that. So for example, course, correspondences between speakers and suffrage organizations clearly demonstrate the strategy of using Irish uh, appeals. For example, the Women's Political Union of New Jersey wanted to arrange a St. Patrick's Day suffrage meeting, and they requested Margaret Foley to speak at, quote, a big mass meeting at the Labor Lyceum for the evening of March 16th. And uh, Ida, Ida Porter Boyer of the Ohio Women's Suffrage Association also wrote to tell Foley that she had been requested for an Irish Day celebration in Cincinnati. She also teased Foley, quote, I would like to see you on Irish Day with your green and white flag, and I say that I am starting to think of votes for women on a grass green background. And then Harriet Taylor Upton, also of the Ohio Women's Suffrage Association, wrote about a fish fry, quote, I put you there because I have an idea it is a Roman Catholic affair. And she continued, quote, I think you had better take your green flag to the fish fry instead of your gold and yellow. And then she said, good luck to you. I hope that grass green flag has a shamrock stitched on the end of it. <laughs> now, Margaret Finchie and Margaret Foley actually worked together for a while in New York. So Hinchy was from New York. Foley was basically from Boston. But they sent Foley to New York for the New York campaign in 1915. So the two Margarets worked together, kind of working, again, the Irish vote in particular. Um, about the two Margarets, the New York Times says, quote, Maggie and Maggie offered Irish vim to the campaign, but when Hinchy missed her appointment to shake hands with Foley, the Times remarked, quote, where, oh, where is Maggie Hinchy of New York? She may be talking suffrage in the trenches with her friends, or over on the docks, or 20 stories up on the framework of some new building in her search for votes for women, 
Hinchy took her message to the Bowery, the trenches, the pier, appealing to workers, not just in terms of class solidarity, but also as an Irish immigrant woman. In 1914, she offered to quote, go down to Washington and tell them that the Irish do want the vote. And she also recalled a conversation with an Irish woman who said, quote, they have a nerve to say that Irish women don't want the vote. There is a society for every county in Ireland and not an anti, we'll get into one of them, the woman said. And the New York Times also reported on Hinchy's ability to appeal to Irish voters, quote, when Maggie got up to speak, the Bowery succumbed to a man. Brothers, began Maggie, rolling her R's with good Irish brogue. They always talk about their good Irish brogue, of course. As she went on, her audience alt alternately wiped its tears and shook with laughter. Irish women are always funny, too. They have silver tongues, and they're always funny. When they get discussed in the press, I'm saying. Um, and so she's uh, essentially being sent out to appeal to ethnic uh, voters and to union voters. So my third category, of course, is Catholic voters, and that will eventually get me to the rest of my PowerPoint, okay? We talked about the importance of church work, and we talked about the fact that suffragists were waking up to the fact they really needed to do more work uh, among churches and that they were specifically looking for Catholic votes, particularly in New York and Massachusetts. Both New York and Massachusetts had suffrage re referenda in 1915. Both of them failed. Both of them failed, okay? <clears throat> but the Committee on Church Work was listing Catholic women as its main priority. And so what they were particularly concerned about is they believed that Catholics thought the church was opposed to suffrage. Even though the church took no official position on suffrage, and that's where the flyer will come in in just a minute, I'll talk about that. There was no official position on suffrage, but there were some high profile people, including the Pope, of course, but also Cardinal Gibbons of Baltimore, who were anti suffrage, who were known to be anti suffrage. And so uh, the concern among suffragists was that, that, um, that people would assume that an official position had been taken. Um, Cardinal Gibbons of Baltimore was anti suffrage in 1910. Uh, he told students at St. Catherine's Normal Institute not to follow in the steps of suffrage advocates who, quote, had become mannish in their ways and who fight for a place in politics. However, by 1913, he had clarified position, saying that although he personally opposed the movement, quote, the mission of the Catholic Church is to define faith and morals. In other matters, individuals decide for themselves. And so for suffragists, this is really key because that's exactly what they're trying to do is separate out individual opinion from official uh, teaching and policy. And so there's a big push, particularly 1914, 15, around there, a big push uh, to reach out to Catholics and to get as many uh, uh, Catholic suffragists also on record. So they, they start to... to um, Publish literature that says, you know, from, from, from priests who are also suffragists. Um, they also quote uh, famous or, or pretty well-known Catholics in the press, and they, they put out uh, literature for people to read. So, for example, the Women's Journal, which was a suffrage newspaper, quoted Margaret Haley in 1912. Margaret Haley is from Chicago. She was pretty well-known within her own time. She was an important... Um, she was a suffragist, of course, but she was also an important uh, teacher organizer. She was a, kind of a pioneer in uh, what eventually became the American Federation of Teachers. And she says in 1912, she says, quote, the Catholic Church does not oppose progress. And, quote, if I believed it did, I would not belong to it. And so with the help of Catholic supporters, suffragists start to publish literature to demonstrate Catholic support for suffrage. They publish flyers. Uh, and even some books that focus on eminent Catholics and their views on suffrage. So I've got one, whoops, wrong way. I've got one. I know you're not supposed to be able to read that. That's just, but I, so I copied one for you as well. Uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, all were putting out these kinds of flyers that focus on Catholic opinion on the suffrage question. So the one I copied for you is from New York. It comes right out of Leonore O'Reilly's personal papers. I had some from Massachusetts, and this one is from Pennsylvania, and I'll explain a little bit more about Pennsylvania in a minute. But so you can see one of them specifically says, Catholic Church not opposed to suffrage. And in both cases, there's a whole lot of text on there, but it's largely different quotes from different people um, who do support suffrage, and quite a few people did support suffrage. 
Um, Margaret Finn, who was a friend of Leonore O'Reilly's, I don't know anything about Margaret Finn. One of the things about doing women's history that you just kind of have to accept is that there will be people you can never trace, that you don't know anything about them, that two letters show up in an archive somewhere, you don't know what they look like, you don't even know in this case if they were Irish or not. Um, but she was a friend of Leonore, Leonore O'Reilly's and she was Catholic. And she wrote a few letters to Leonore O'Reilly, which is how I know who she was. Um, she was actually a factory inspector. She was a working woman who had become a factory inspector who was also active in the suffrage movement. And so she writes to Leonore O'Reilly about the flyers that you have in front of you. And she says, quote, I had no idea before I saw it that we had so many of my church people with us. And then she re reported, quote, making good use of them the following year and working, quote, like a beaver for the Women's Suffrage Party. That's in New York. This example here is from Pennsylvania. And then ultimately in 1914, a woman by the name of Margaret Hayden Rourke uh, wrote an actual book called Letters and Addresses on Women's Suffrage by Catholic Ecclesiastics. And so that was published and circulated as well. And Margaret Hayden Rourke is another one of those people I can't find out too much about, except her maiden name was Monahan. Um, and she ends up, she was an actress briefly in New York, and then she ends up like the color authority. Like she was the one whose job it was, was to like name colors. Like, periwinkle blue and things like that. And she actually is kind of famous, again, not fa famous, but she was well known, reasonably well known in her own times. Um, but she doesn't show up in other suffrage organizations very much, so I can't tell you very much about her. So to re reach Catholic audiences, again, uh, speakers are being sent out, literature is being circulated. I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, the Equal Franchise League of Pittsburgh writes, writes to Leonore O'Reilly and says, quote, we are having a big Catholic picnic here. And one of the priests, head of the biggest parish in the city, offered to put a Catholic committee of women suffragists in charge. So again, here you see a pretty, uh, a pretty big opportunity for suffragists to actually talk to people directly through the church. Uh, and in this case, uh, he, the, he says uh, that the tents can have suffrage speakers. And then O'Reilly, who's not a practicing Catholic herself, sends Margaret Hinchy instead, and she says, quote, Miss Margaret Hinchy of New York is our working woman suffragist who has worked especially among the Catholic women and has been successful, I believe, in making priests see that our cause is just. Uh, and Hinchy was sent out for another, uh, a number of other Catholic missions as well. So for example, uh, during the New Jersey campaign, Hinchy spent almost three weeks making street speeches, visiting Catholic clergy, and attending meetings of Irish societies. And while she was in Montana also circulating, giving speeches, particularly labor speeches. We talked about all, all that already. She was advertised as a speaker in the local newspaper, and it said, quote, a special invitation is extended to the Catholic women to be present at this rally tonight. So again, they were highlighting her union connections, but also highlighting uh, her Catholicness. In 1917, New York passes women's suffrage. So w New York women get the right to vote in 1917. Just before the election, Margaret Hinchy writes an article for a newspaper called The Gaelic American. So for those of you interested in Irish nationalism, that's John DeVoy's newspaper out of New York, OK? Uh, and she makes three arguments why the Irish men of New York should be voting for women's suffrage. She makes three arguments. One of them is a class labor argument. One of them is an Irish nationalist argument. And one of them is a Catholic argument. So it fits pretty well into what we've been talking about. So she says, quote, um, she reminds Irish New Yorkers that the recent rebellion in Ireland, of course this is 1917, so uh, she's talking about 1916, appealed um, uh, that the recent rebellion in Ireland witnessed the construction of a new constitution, one that included women's suffrage. Next, she appeals to class solidarity and self-interest, demanding the vote not only because women must work, but also because they were left defenseless when laboring men went to war. 1917, so the U.S. gets involved in World War I. And then she says that while the men are away, the women need to be able to protect the interest of all the working class. And finally, Hinchy urges Irish men to vote for women's suffrage in the spirit of justice and to, quote, be true to the teachings of Christ and the Catholic Church. In addition to the activities of Hinchy and Foley, a number of Catholic organizations also start to endorse suffrage around this time. The Catholic Student Association of America 
endorses suffrage before World War I, the Catholic Order of Foresters, the Catholic Women's League, and the Ladies Catholic Benevolent Association also endorsed women's suffrage after, or at least in the case of the Ladies Catholic Benevolence Association, it's 1917, so after or, or during the war, I guess I should say. Um, and Margaret Foley is also going out and giving talks for Catholic women. So, for example, in 1912, one local chapter of the Daughters of Isabella um, asked Margaret Foley to come and educate them about suffrage. And the president of the local chapter says, quote, We are very ignorant on the suffrage question. You know, living as we do in the country, and we are anxious to learn. For instance, we would like to know how the suffrage, if gained, would affect the status of the working girl, its advantages, and in short, we would be glad to know how far the suffragists have progressed along labor lines and just what they aim to do. So she's talking specifically about class issues there. And then she goes on to explain that their group, their suffrage group, or their, their, uh, their group does not, does not um, associate with the suffrage group in town, they say, because, quote, it is composed of the idle rich and not affiliated with our society in any way. And as their interest in labor issues suggests, many of the women in the chapter were also of modest economic background. So for example, one seventh of the members were unorganized, in other words, ununionized working women. The others were teachers, stenographers, nurses, and married women, okay? And they felt alienated from the mainstream suffrage movement, but they were anxious to learn, and so they asked for Foley to come and educate them. Now, as I mentioned, the suffrage referenda in Massachusetts and New York both do fail. And so what that means on a personal level for Foley and Hinchy is that they both essentially lose their jobs, that they had become suffrage speakers, suffrage organizers, that they were paid to go to Nevada or to go to Montana or to go to Ohio, and that that was their job. And so when those two referendum, well, New York's going to have another one in 1917, so Hinchy will have another two years. But essentially, both of them are going to find themselves kind of pushed out of the movement, or at least in part. And so Foley actually writes to the head of the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association and says, why aren't you using me? I'm a well-known Catholic in the most, Cat Boston, right, the most Catholic city you know, uh, in, in the US, and why aren't you using me? And essentially, the president, whose name was Al Stone Blackwell, the daughter of a famous suffragist from the 19th century, uh, Lucy Stone, basically says, well, you know, we're really focusing on quiet lobbying behind closed doors kind of stuff, not really the kind of stuff, you know, that you'd be very well suited for. So Foley had been trained to essentially go out there, heckle, you know, be loud, be assertive, and they said, you know, indirect influence is probably not going to be, you know, your best place. And so Foley, uh, will find herself looking for another job, and eventually she will get another job, which is kind of my next topic in just a minute, working for a separate Catholic suffrage organization, okay? Um, but Hinchy has the same problem after suffrage wins in 1917. Now Hinchy's also largely out of a job, and she actually ends up going back to the laundry. She looks around, she can't find anything, she ends up back in the laundry. And Leonora O'Reilly tries to help. She tries to raise funds, and they actually have a Margaret Hinchy fund that they put aside money for Margaret Hinchy to have. Um, and O'Reilly explains in private how important she feels that Margaret Hinchy was to the suffrage campaign. So she says, quote, Margaret is unique. She has really played a significant part in getting the vote. She feels this. So do others. There are as many misunderstand her, her usefulness as those who understand it. Uh, and so there is some money set aside for Margaret Hinchy, but as I said, she ends up back in the, uh, the laundry eventually. Okay, so my next topic then is the development of separate Catholic suffrage organizations. What we've been talking about so far is how suffrage organizations tried to appeal to Catholics how they understood, particularly in the early 20th century, that they really needed to do better outreach among Catholics and among working class voters and among Irish voters and all of those sort of over overlapping categories, and also how they started to really try to educate Catholics on what they considered a misunderstanding of official, uh, official church policy. 
Um, but by the, say, 1911 to 1915, actually 1919 range, the sort of the 19 teens, you start to have the creation of separate Catholic suffrage organizations. And these have really only been written about a tiny bit. There is a dissertation that came out a few years ago um, as well. But the picture I have here is actually from London. This is the first, and this is from 1911. Uh, the Catholic Women's Suffrage Society was founded in 1911 uh, by a small group of British suffragists. Um, and then th that, the founding of that group was also publicized in the U.S., so people knew about it uh, in the U.S. Uh, shortly after that as well. Uh, a year later, uh, women in Brussels would organize the Roman Catholic Women's Suffrage League. And then in 1915, women in Ireland founded... Uh, the Catholic Women's Suffrage Association, led by a woman by the name of Mary Hayden. Mary Hayden was a history professor, yay, at University College Dublin, and she founded the group in 1915 as a nonpartisan, non militant organization, which sought to inspire Catholic women to work for suffrage and social reform. Okay? Now, these uh, groups are also an inspiration in the US, and you will start to get American. Catholic suffrage organizations as well. Uh, the first founded by a woman by the name of Jane Campbell. Jane Campbell's not, her picture's not up there. Um, she is actually, of all the women uh, in this presentation, she's actually the suffragist the longest. She was a suffragist really from the 19th century who had been involved in the suffrage movement from really very early on and very active in Philadelphia, which is where she lived. Um, she was Irish, she was Catholic, um, she never married. Um, and she, in 1914, founded a separate Catholic women's suffrage organization called the Catholic Women's Suffrage League in Philadelphia in 1914. There were also Catholic suffrage organizations in New York and Boston. I believe there was one in Buffalo, but I can't find anything on it. I just found a reference that there was one, or they were organizing one in Buffalo. I don't know the name. I don't know who joined, so I couldn't actually include it. But I suspect if someone went back to this topic, they would find more. I really think there are more out there. There just there's no, there's no, seems to be no record of them. So the woman I want to focus on then next is a woman by the name of Sarah McPike. Sarah McPike was from New York. And she was involved in social reform. She was, her parents were from Ireland. She worked as the executive secretary to the advertising department at GM or something like that. So she had a pretty good clerical job, but she's certainly not what I would call middle class. But she was organized with a group of, a group of fairly prominent women um, in a group called the St. Catherine's Welfare Organization. Yeah, St. Catherine's Welfare Organization. And so the daughter of a senator, the wife of the Comptroller of New York, a pretty well-known writer. These are all women who kind of organized this group. So largely what I would call a middle-class group with Mick Pike in there as an organizer. And Mick Pike was really active in the Democratic Party later as well. So she stays active. Um, the group, as the name suggests, was first, firstly uh, interested in social reform and mostly interested in, la in labor legislation, trying to get labor laws to improve the lives of working women. But due to largely frustration and lack of progress at getting labor legislation, they turned their efforts to suffrage. And so they became, although they're not a suffrage society maybe in the truest sense, they basically said, we're just going to work for suffrage now, okay? So in 19... 15, I want to say, because I'm, now I'm off my notes. 1915, the group announced that due to unsatisfactory progress on labor legislation, that they would focus just on suffrage. So McPike said, quote, believing that better conditions can only be secured through legislation and that all disenfranchised persons are at a disadvantage when seeking remedial legislation, the organization has concentrated its activities to date on the votes for women plank. Okay, so I'm putting that in the Catholic suffrage uh, category. And so again, uh, one of the things she's particularly interested in is, is, is talking to Catholics um, about whether or not the church is opposed. She writes a private letter to uh, uh, an Irish-American lawyer by the name of Bort Cochran. So again, if you're interested in Irish nationalism, he, Irish nationalism, he was the head of the United Irish League of America. Um, and so he has papers in New York. And she says to him, quote, 
There is determined opposition by members of the hierarchy to women's suffrage. Men voters in the Society of the Holy Name and the Knights of Columbus are opposing the movement because of this. So in 1917, McPike leads a delegation of 24 women representing several Catholic organizations to meet with Cardinal James Gibbons of Baltimore, who we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, and they have a good meeting, and he promises to give the subject earnest consideration. And in 1917 also, because of the New York referenda, suffrage does pass, and McPike moves on pretty quickly to expressing concern over radicalism. And so she talks about the need to bring home uh, to Catholic women the truth that free government next to the Christian religion is the greatest boon the human race has achieved and that suffrage is a sacred obligation. And she warns Catholic voters that unless they place themselves on the side of real social reform, that the Socialist Party with its doctrine in regarding to morality will gain strength. In other words, she's particularly warning people against, well, in her words, two things, socialism and feminism, okay? And so she's talking to Catholic women about the importance of using the vote, using the vote that they now have, and using it for social reform to, social reform to pass labor legislation to improve conditions for the working class, okay? And she stays involved in democratic politics, like I mentioned, and she continues to warn against the dangers of, of feminism uh, and after, after 1918, Bolshevism. Um, and the other um, organization I want to tell you about briefly is called the Margaret Brent Suffrage Guild, and I don't think I have any pictures for you because I couldn't find any at all. But you know Margaret Foley, so we're going to go back to a picture of her, which is way back. There we go. Um, the Margaret Brent Suffrage Guild was another set, uh, Catholic suffrage organization, but it was founded the latest of the three that I've told you about. It really wasn't founded until really on the eve of suffrage, and they, 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 they put out their first kind of big blitz of material in 1919, okay? So suffrage was already coming. And so it's not so much just about suffrage as getting ready for what happens after suffrage. So the Margaret Brent Suffrage Guild, again, I would say is largely a middle-class organization. I think Margaret Foley's Association with, association with that group can be misunderstood. She worked for them. Okay? It was her job after she left the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. She was looking for something. She ends up with the Margaret Brent Guild. She was not the president. She was not in charge. She did not make policy. But she was the organizer. Okay? The president was, the woman, was a woman by the name of Mrs. Well, she's usually referred to as Mrs. Frank Scanlon. Her name was Evelyn. Again, I know almost nothing about her. She's hard, harder than you would think she would be to find out about. Um, she was Irish. She was Catholic. That I know. Her family had a furniture business. That's about all I really know about her. Um, but she was the president of the League. Uh, Margaret Foley's job was to go out and organize new branches of the League to recruit new uh, speakers uh, and also, of course, to get more Catholic women to support suffrage. So a fundraising letter from 1919 said, quote, uh, targeted, quote, public-spirited Catholics, explaining the purpose of the organization as Americanization, teaching the foreign-born what American institutions mean, and that they also sought to organize Catholic women along civic lines in order that they may be more completely informed in regard to the various departments of our government and to prepare them for the vote. Okay, so the vote is coming, uh, and they want women to be educated about it. Ultimately, Foley will be sent out, and she'll have some success. She spends time in, Cam in Cambridge, Massachusetts, organizing there. And ultimately, in 15 days, she enrolls 500 women, gathers 147 names of uh, people to interview for, uh, for speaking, and she identifies 20 splendid workers. Uh, and ultimately, by 1923, the Boston Globe will report that the Guild had branched out through the entire state and claimed several thousand members, okay? They also changed their name, uh, particularly after suffrage passes, uh, and they continue to try and educate uh, voters on, along civic lines. They also, like um, Sarah McPike, denounce the influence of radicalism um, and have concerns about feminism as well. They specifically um, offer themselves, now called the Margaret Brent Civic League, as an alternative to the League of Women Voters, um, who I don't consider, and I just spoke to, there, there's a small League of Women Voters in Mount Pleasant, where I'm from. They're celebrating their 100th anniversary, too. 
because essentially once suffrage passed, the suffrage movement kind of vanished and they became the League of Women Voters. So they're ce ce celebrating their birthday too. I wouldn't call them radical. How <laughs> however, um, Scanlon saw the organization, her organization, as an alternative to the League of Women Voters, and she argued that Catholic women could not accept some of the positions endorsed by the League of Women Voters, including loans to Britain, and that's where you kind of get into her Irishness, and she denounces the League of Nations and other things. And ultimately, the Margaret Brent um, Civic League is quite friendly with uh, the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic. So there's a sort of, there's a nationalist connection there which again, I can't find enough about to tell you much, but I know it's there, and I know that Scanlon's connected in that way too. So they have sympathy that way. In 1919, a speaker to the Margaret Brent League um, from Boston College urged members to avoid the radicalism of some suffrage supporters, and he warned of alliances with those who would, quote, push their views on easy divorce, economic independence, free love, and birth control. So again, you see a, f a fairly consistent pattern there with some of the concerns about what comes next after suffrage, and also the way that uh, voters are being educated to vote and use their vote uh, to protect their values. So finally, what I would like to say is that in these examples, you see part of a much larger story, which is the movement of Catholic women into the suffrage movement in several different ways. And we didn't even talk about Irish nationalism. We could, but we didn't. So that you see working class, move, working class women who, who move towards suffrage really beginning in the 1890s, honestly. Uh, as women really start to get organized through the labor movement, they pretty quickly start saying working class women need the vote. And by the early 20th century, they're the obvious choice for speakers when the movement needs suffrage speakers who can talk about labor, but who also are Irish and who are also Catholic. So there's that group. That group's been written about a lot for, in terms of their labor union activities, but not so much in terms of the way that their suffrage, uh, uh, suffrage activities uh, appeal to ethnic voters. And then you have this second group, uh, which I'm calling, again, loosely middle-class Catholic women, uh, who come at it from a social reform perspective, who want to be active in social reform, who want to sponsor or help, help pass legislation that'll help working class women, but who also recognize that they need the vote to do that. And ultimately, those women will also start by 1915, in the US anyway, to break off into separate Catholic organizations. Some of them were already involved in the suffrage movement for quite a long time before they did that. So I'm going to leave it there and open it up to questions. No, that's a great question. I think the answer is yes, there definitely are, are parallels going on in Chicago. I would say one of the kind of little secrets that, you know, research already know is that you have to go where the papers you have available take you. And it happens that the Women's Trade Union League was organized in the early 20th century. The Women's Trade Union League was really all about getting better working conditions for women. But, of course, they also very quickly realized that suffrage was a key part of that. And so you have that connection. So all of these women have a background in the Women's Trade Union League. Foley, O'Reilly, Hinchy, they all worked with the Women's Trade Union League. And then were also sent out through the suffrage organizations. Does that make sense? There was the Women's Trade Union League in Chicago as well. And there are some really um, 
Again, I, well known is such a terrible word because historians might know them, but it's really a small number of us, right? Um, there are some important labor leaders coming out of Chicago who are Irish and who are Catholic and who are suffragists. Um, and I include them a little bit, but you don't, I don't think, I wouldn't say they're making the rounds quite as visibly in the press. So, for example, I mentioned Margaret Haley only briefly, although she's written about a lot by historians because she does have good papers, because she was so active with teachers. She was a suffragist, and I don't know if she tours a little bit, but she's just not, I mean, when you look through the New York Times, that you're not going to find her name. And I can't remember, I know I use the Chicago Press, so I don't think she's out there as much, but was she a suffragist? Yes. Um, there's another labor leader by the name of Agnes Nestor who eventually will become the president of the Women's Trade Union League. And she's younger than O'Reilly. O'Reilly was, uh, you know, began in the labor movement in the 19th century. And so although I didn't talk about it today, when I, when I wrote this project, my first kind of suffragist little group are by the 1890s on record for suffrage, Leonora O'Reilly, um, not Margaret Foley, because she comes later. Um, 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 why am I blanking on? Uh, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, who was also from Boston, uh, was really already pretty big on suffrage by the 1890s. Um, and then some other kind of 19th century people. So Foley's kind of the next generation. She's 20th century, Agnes Nestor's 20th century. But I don't think, Agnes Nestor was this tiny little shy, you know, she, I, she wasn't out there giving speeches for suffrage. But yes, Chicago is really important, and of course, there's a, there are a lot of good sources from Chicago um, for suffrage and for teachers, but as far as like these speakers that were in demand, that's at least, according to the newspaper, that, that's who you got. Yeah. Following up on that question, uh, you don't mention Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. <laughs> it was a big project. <laughs> And I have to say, I was always trying to bring it back in to be like, I'm finally going to finish this project someday, right? Some of the quotes, I mean, you're right. Some of the quotes that I gave you came from Pittsburgh. And certainly there are, I mean, every, not every state, many of these states did have suffrage referenda, right? I mean, Michigan, I've been in Michigan for 12 years and I never mentioned Michigan either, but, you know, Michigan had its own failed suffrage referenda and then it passed in 1918. So I mean, you would you would have uh, you would have um, uh, speakers in all those areas, but the Women's Trade Union League was had, was uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, St. Louis. I want to say were kind of their kind of stronger ones. Um, and as far as like what newspapers I read, uh, this is I tell my students because I mean I don't think they understand. It hasn't been well so long since we did our PhDs, right? But you know when I was a graduate student, they had just started to really release a lot of databases where you could search newspapers. But I was using the Irish Press. I read the National Hibernian. I read these on microfilm. I sat. I mean, the people in the microfilm room knew me because I was there every day for hours, just going through microfilm trying to find any mentions of women. So I, I, I did. I did have to be strategic about it. And I was reading Irish papers. So I read New York. I read Boston. I read Chicago. Um, and I just whatever names were coming out. That's who I ended up focusing on. But yeah, I mean, I think for sure. Um, you know, and that's why I'm saying I think if someone did another project, I know there is a dissertation on Catholic suffragists, and she didn't really find anybody that I didn't find, but I think if you started looking at some of these other cities, you'd find them. I think they're there, but it's a lot harder to find. It's a lot harder to find, especially if your newspapers aren't digitized. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm neglecting this half room, and I'll be right there. Yeah, question. Uh, at this time, the uh, temperance movement was really heating up. And that was Roman Romanism and so on. Uh, what were the position of these Irish women and, and these temperance movements at this time? That's a good question. Can you tell me about the mic? I'd like to know. Um, there was a separate Catholic temperance movement. So there was a largely Protestant temperance movement in the 19th century. But the, yeah, so there was a Catholic temperance organization. Women did get involved in it, although slightly later. So again, there's some overlap there. It's not really surprising that women in the temperance movement would also be suffragists, because they usually were. 
Um, as far as what their personal position on temperance was, I can't tell you for sure that they were temperance advocates. For the most part, at least Leonora O'Reilly's a kind of an easier example because she was involved in so much, but she was involved in the labor movement, the suffrage movement, the peace movement, the Irish nationalist movement. I don't think she was ever involved in the temperance movement. And I don't think I've come across too many women who were. Well, the Knights of Labor from the 19th century was originally led by temperance, you know. So yeah, I mean, uh, there were there were, was a lot of overlap between temperance and labor in the 19th century. But I don't think those these individual women were active in the temperance movement, which I think is what you're asking, right? <clears throat> I don't think they were personally active in the temperance movement, with the exception, and I've never mentioned her, but there's a woman by the name of Leonora Berry who becomes Leonora Berry late. She was uh, a union organizer who became very active in the temperance movement, and she's on record for suffrage, but not as active. I mean, she doesn't go out and really do a lot of suffrage campaigning, so she didn't make it into this talk. I, I locked off the 19th century, even though I love the 19th century. I decided to focus on Twitter. We had come to the inside of her. Yes. Um, in the picture we saw of Maud Malone, the perspective shows really quite a number of bowler hats, obviously, <laughs> the men in the audience. Well, as, a, as an historian, could you tell in general whether the men were there in general supporting or were they oh, there heckling? That's I'm a great interested question. in their attitude. Yeah. It, it is just so surprising. Yeah. You saw mainly men, but it might have been the perspective, but they were right. all gathered together. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. What the suffrage movement did in the early 20th century was they started having what they called open air meetings, <laughs> which Ma Malone specifically said she took. Um, out of, from the example of the Socialists and the Salvation Army. These were two groups who had, had great success just going out and speaking to people, and it's free. Because if it's an open air meeting, it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to rent a hall. And so that's actually what uh, Maud Malone got in trouble for, is going and doing these open air meetings without a permit. And so I don't know specifically of that picture, but chances are what you're seeing is that she's chosen what we today call a target-rich environment, <laughs> and that I'm going to go there and I'm going to give a suffrage speech. So I, I tell my students when I when I tell them, oh, I need to get off my soapbox, you know, that kind of that 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 uh, suggestion. But this is what they were doing: is they were going, they were putting out their you know their soapbox or their crate, or later on they were standing on the hoods of cars so that they could be big, and they were just giving a speech, open air meetings. So that's what I suspect you see, and that's what. Let me go back to, I put some extra pictures on here that um, that I didn't talk about because they're not Irish. This one right here, right, the, she's a, a woman by the name of Harriet Stanton Blatch. She's actually the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but that's the same kind of idea, right? You see all the men and all the hats. So she's giving an open air meeting and that's, so that's, there was a whole generation of suffragists in the early 20th century said, okay, we need to do, we need to get out there. We need to be more creative, we need to be more militant, and open air meetings is a, sort of a 20th century invention. Um, so it's interesting that yeah. you show that one. The one I noticed, uh, you hadn't shown that one before, was Maud Malone. And there again, you see a, yeah. lot, you see a lot of men. Now, uh, I'm men just wondering whether we have any idea of what their attitude was, and of course that would be very big. Right. Whether it was gentle support, or was there a kind of um, No, there's no way to say. Um, Maud Malone herself was considered a militant, so she would get her share of credit, <coughs> no doubt. Um, but I would imagine that she's just hitting a place where she knows she's going to get a lot of people coming out of work or getting on the train or, you know, heading home. <coughs> heading home. She's just basically going to a place where, um, where, she's going to, um, where she's going to find um, an audience. But was there heckling? I'm sure there was. But, but I can't, there's so few pictures, I think I've only seen two pictures of Maud Malone anyway. And most, for the most part, there's no background, you know, from the Library of Congress, they don't have any background on, on what it is. <laughs> Other questions? So I mean, yes. Now, we, we didn't mention, and I don't know whether she was really substantive, but Mother Jones was supposedly Irish. She was an Irish suffragist. She wasn't a suffragist. No, she was not know. She was very involved in the labor movement. She was Irish born, um, but she no, she didn't. She wasn't a suffragist, and she didn't really think that you know 
like working through the suffrage movement was the way to go. She was all all working she had class movement. Opinion of that. Right. She was about you know the working class movement. Um, and you know the suffrage organizations, particularly in, within Mother Jones's lifetime, are really <coughs> dominated by middle class policy women. So she wasn't going to be bothered. Well, she wasn't going to interfere with it. Yeah. I have a second question, though. Sure. And when the, the uh, in, in 1960, there were a lot of women involved in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the Easter Rising. Uh, did, were they aware of it? Were these women aware of that? And, and they had they had suffered just a couple of years later and really sure. changed Ireland forever. Yeah. I mean, one of the really great things about this project and the reason why it seems like it never did end, like I could keep working on it for 10 more years, and I think there'd be more stuff to find. Is that there really is great? Uh, there are great connections between the U.S. and Ireland, right? Whatever's going on in Ireland they, is known about in the U.S., but also people are coming. People are coming and going, right? So there are a lot of Irish citizens who are spending time, some of them significant amounts of time, in the U.S. Um, and particularly after 1916, trying to uh, rally for the cause of the Irish Republic. So in other words, get American sympathy for the Irish Republic. Um, but of course, Ireland has a suffrage movement as well. So you've got Irish suffragists, you've got Irish nationalists in Ireland, and then you've got suffragists in America, some of whom are Irish, uh, and many of whom are also, those who are Irish are also often Irish nationalists. So there are connections, and there are sometimes letters going back and forth between Irish suffragists and American suffragists, and sometimes, again, like I said, people spending time in the U.S. They voted in 1980, Yes. And so ultimately, you do have um, yeah, a lot of knowledge and a lot of connections, and sometimes even cooperation. So for example, suffrage organizations and Irish nationalist organizations in the US, they know of each other, right? They want each other's help. Um, and sometimes they even sort of model. So some of the women in the Irish nationalist movement are kind of emulating or modeling themselves after some of the militant suffrage techniques as well. So there's a lot of kind of cross-pollination there, absolutely. I, I have a link question to that. Is it true that the Irish suffrage movement was really very small and very minuscule? And for instance, when even Del Hare came here for his year away from his family and young children and all that, he barely mentioned women's suffrage, as far yes. as I understand. So, is, is there any evidence that these American uh, suffragists were really disappointed at the lack of <coughs> progress back in the homeland? A little bit earlier than that, I would say yes, particularly with the Irish Parliamentary Party or earlier in the 20th century. There were some Irish American suffragists who were unhappy with remnants, and of course there were lots of Irish suffragists who were unhappy with remnants. So I mean, I think that's an easier example to say, where you saw sort of, again, a kind of a cross-Atlantic sort of sigh of, you know, uh, disgust is not the right word, but you know what I mean, right? Sort of a, a disapproval. Um, yeah, and, and really as far as, I mean, we didn't talk about Irish nationalism, we don't have time to um, But what, what's going on in the U.S. for women in Irish nationalism is coming slightly later. So that, you know, Irish women are, are already organizing uh, in Ireland, and then some of the more, I would call them one of the more radical side Americans are organizing in New York as well. So suffrage isn't their first priority, but some of them are suffragists, right? So again, there's that. Sort of always that difficult Irish nationalists and suffragists, there's a difficult relationship there in Ireland. And it, it, some of that's going to also be true in the US. I mean, it's not that they aren't the suffragists necessarily, but that may not be their top priority. In, in Leonora O'Reilly's case, I would probably say she's a suffragist first. And she comes to Irish nationalism fairly late. I don't know if that answers your question, but close. <laughs> uh, this is a question about the citizenship, and it might feel past who that, but um, one issue that lingered until 1922 was that American women who married non-U.S. citizens lost their U.S. citizenship. Is that an issue that the women you looked at tackled at all? Because uh, I imagine they're so close to their own Irish heritage, it should be something they cared about, right? I haven't seen that at all. Yeah. So I've, I've always wondered who pushed that issue. And I'm, I'm <coughs> Probably, I would say not, at least not like the working class, that group there. Um, and I haven't seen it, but I haven't seen the records either, so as far as that, really hard to connect it. Anyone else I'm missing over here? Yes. This will be the last question. In your book, you mentioned how um, some bishops were upset with the women in the land league. Were there any bishops upset in um, willing to communicate women for being a part of the suffrage at 
I haven't seen in the U.S. I haven't seen anything. Hmm. I, I don't think so. I, I, so I the officials were supportive of them. In, in um, well, it, it was the reason they put out all those flyers was to show that it was very individual. So there were some yes and some no, and there were certainly you know some who were on record as opposed, but there were also quite a few who were on record in support. But as far as specific threats of excommunication, I've only seen that for the land leave, and I've only seen that in a couple of cases. There was that big, it's a while, I didn't review that, it was a bit of a while, but there was that big controversy in, I think it was Cleveland, yeah, where the women were essentially, uh, you know, really sort of exchanging barbs with the bishop, who was not Irish, and so they were like, you know, they were sort of like, well, you're not Irish, and, you know, <laughs> but he was like, well, I'm going to excommunicate you. Yeah, there was that one. Um, I can't even think of any other American example of that, though. That was really the only one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was fascinating. I mean, really, they, they was a big, there was a big battle with him. But I haven't seen any others. No, not for summers that I can think of. I, I know you said it's the last one, so catch me afterwards. <laughs> if I didn't get to you. <laughs> Please join me in thanking you.